when I was 19, uh, I was walking along the Maribyrnong River, a very early one morning with my dog, and a man drove up in a van, which when he pulled up rather alarmed me, and a young a man in his 30s jumped out and said, don't jump. <laughs> My name's Louise Lanay. My book is called Eden Hope and it's published by text. Mani is an ordinary woman, no longer young. Uh, she's divorced, she has one child, uh, she is getting on with her life and the, the greatest barrier in her life is, um, is that her child has a, an addiction. Her, her adult daughter has an addiction. And uh, when we start the story, when we start the flow, um, she's on her own. She's living in a granny flat because that's all she can afford now in the suburbs in Melbourne. And uh, her daughter has moved away with her family. But very shortly after she settles into this new piece, this new tiny place where she lives and is happy, the daughter arrives back with a boyfriend, with two children, two of her three children, and says, can I come to, to stay for a night? But Marnie knows it won't be. The, the, the request for a night means indefinitely. And what that brings with it is a whole lot of other demands, demands on her time, on her finances, uh, on her ability to make their lives work because they're not making them work. And she realises she's not going to be able to do it. She's getting too old. It's getting beyond her and she knows they will bring their drugs with them and things will get out of hand very quickly. Um, and th this is exactly as it begins to unfold. And so she decides she just needs to get away, but she doesn't go alone. She takes the children. It's not a, an act that she thinks much about, but she just does it. She has no money. She has a car. She has two very small children in the back of it and she just gets away. And the result of that is that she's very quickly unable to provide the, the thing she wants to provide for them, which is security and love and all those things you want to provide for your children. So she, um, she finds herself in a place she doesn't know, in the country, in the Wimmera, driving around, taking it quietly and slowly because she can't really afford the petrol to, to you know, go a long distance. Um, and she wants to look after them, but things go wrong. And she finally finds herself, she gets some help, she gets some emergency housing, and she finds herself in a country town she's never been to before, right on the edge of Victoria, called Eden Hope. Yes, it is. It is a real town. I lived for 20 years very close to it. So I know the town. It's not the town I lived in, which was a town of 200 people. Eden Hope has a slightly bigger population. Uh, it's a farming town. It's, um, uh, you know, got people in it getting by every day, working farmers, people who run a few shops, you know, teachers, there's a school, there's um, churches, you know, and a, and a hospital. And it's just a town I knew and used to drive through quite regularly. It's the way through from Western Victoria into South Australia. Well, I write, I guess that's the first answer. And it's a, I don't mean to be glib, but I've always got some sort of story going on. Um, this is my second novel. Um, I've taught, um, professional writing and editing. I've written for TV, but I've always got a story in my head. And this one I thought about for quite a long time before I put it onto paper. I thought about escape. I thought about the barriers to getting what you want. And in this day and age, a lot of the barriers for older women are financial ones. So I thought about those. I thought about the ramifications. I thought about family. You know, I'm a grandmother, I have children. Because it was lockdown and because I had time, I, I started going to the library, my local library. I live in Western Victoria in a country town and uh, writing for three or four hours a day. And it was, it was a good experience, I have to say. I know, you know, we spend a lot of time agonising and worrying and I don't think I felt that uh, high stress about getting the story out. Sometimes I, I went down a wrong path and had to backtrack and delete and start again. But generally speaking, I, I'm very grateful that I knew my direction. 
I knew where I wanted to be and that was a great help. Well, I have, I have a few grandchildren and a couple of them were that age when I was right here. They're a little older now and I've got another very young one. Uh, so, yes, I was watching them. I was coming to Melbourne from the country and doing a bit of babysitting and watching the children. Um, I like children. I like people. I'm a people watcher like most writers are. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so Koa and Frankie are based on probably all of my grandchildren at some point in their development. I listen to conversation all the time. I think parents of teenagers know how difficult that can be and there's that period where it's make or break with your teenagers because they are setting out in their life and they are rejecting your parenting because it's part of growing up. It's, you know, it's I can do it myself time writ large in the teenage years. I guess I remember that. I remember that because I don't think anyone escapes that. And I observed people becoming older and not managing their lives very well. I, I, I've seen that around me. This isn't a story about an unusual situation. I know of people who care for their grandchildren. I know of people who have children uh, and friends with drug addiction. Most of us have been touched with it at some point in our life. And I've seen that defensiveness, that madness, that refuse, that denial that comes with it because the drug looks after itself. It doesn't want you to, to name it, to try to do anything about it. The drug is like an entity that looks after itself. So if you make a comment, it will have a comeback, which will be possibly illogical, possibly a lie, possibly um, insane, an insane accusation. And you have to deal with that all the time. And I think what I learned, what I researched was that people living with um, addiction in their loved ones are dealing on day to day with insanity, insanity in, in the terms of um, the way they communicate, the way they can't believe often what they're told. Not just awful insanity, but funny insanity. You know, it's farcical sometimes, what you're expected to believe. And I tried to bring that, not just the, it, it's tough, addiction is tough, but I tried to also bring the madness of it and uh, the way it affects the people around you. There are certainly a lot of support groups for a lot of things, thank goodness, um, but there's certainly uh, support groups for uh, addiction. So the, the person who suffers from the addiction has a support group, but the family of the person who uh, suffers addiction can also find support from other people who are dealing with that day-to-day -day madness. Uh, I think uh, dealing with addiction takes away your confidence too. A family who deals with addiction loses confidence in themselves and their ability to make decisions because they're being questioned all the time. And a support group is, it puts back some confidence. It says, it, it validates the feeling of madness you have and it validates. And I think uh, they, they're, they're everywhere. And uh, I think Marnie would have been living in a vacuum not to have been directed to that over the years since her daughter has been an addict since she was around about 16 and is now 37. I couldn't believe through my research that she wouldn't have found her way into those meeting rooms and learned about it. People don't always stay. They often think, no, I can manage it myself. I, I don't want the shame of this um, because there's terrible shame uh, associated with addiction. So Marnie tries to do it herself pretty badly, as it turns out. She wants to be a good grandmother. She wants to look after her children. She really loves her daughter, even though her daughter is impossible to live with. But uh, she probably does need more help than she gets for herself. Heath is a role model in her life from the age of about 18. I started randomly with that story and it, uh, that beginning story of her meeting a strange man on the edge of the Maribyrnong River who offers her a job. And uh, when she's uh, 18. And I, that story continued to give me ideas. So I kept with it. And because she, her father, her own father was dead and she was being brought up by her mother, um, there probably weren't many male role models in her life. And he, it turns out, I mean, you know, it's random. The, the role models we get in life may not be the best ones for us. Uh, so 
I explored that idea that as she's got older, she's begun to look back on that first employer and wonder about the world that she entered and the things, the lessons she learned from it and the people she met. Um, I don't want to spoil the, the narrative, but, um, yeah, she goes back all the time to those things. What the, what the encounter gave her was a love of books. So in her darkest hours, she remembers poetry and she remembers moments that she was given a gift of a book, you know, a read through a Dickens or something like that in her life. And that sustains her in really dark moments. I really like Heath, I have to say. I really like Sheenie, the policeman who comes into her life. And Declan, the, the rather gormless um, caseworker who comes into her life, whose who's kindness itself, falling over himself to be kind. There are, so I, uh, while it is a book about women, I have to say it's mostly a book about women and, and strong relationships, I, I think that men are part of women's lives and we, uh, our relationships with uh, the men in our lives are important too. Um, and we learn, oh, God, we learn something from everybody we meet, don't we? We learn sometimes how not to behave and sometimes the best way to behave. I think I've been taught by people I know in my life the best possible way to behave by some of them. And I've, I've had some bad experiences too, like we all have. Uh, it's what you do with them, I guess. It's, it's the remembering them and thinking about them and forgiving them and being kind, I think, is important. Kindness is important, I think. Uh, Marnie and I were the same age when I was writing it. So I was probably exploring my own ageing and what it's like to, to be invisible, to have a, a, a moderate education, to have begun a few things which I failed at, to have begun a few things which I've been successful at. Women start and stop a work life, don't they, of that generation. I think it's different from here on in. But women of my age, I'm 67 now, they start, they've started and stopped their work life. They've stopped, stopped to have children. They've stopped to care for ageing parents. Um, they've earned, then they've stopped earning and they've relied on a, a partner. And when the partner's gone, they have to rely on whatever they can do to get by. And I wanted that to be truthful. I, I think it's, I didn't want her to be um, uh, trying to be young. I didn't want her to be looking for a partner um, or trying, trying to look glamorous or have a sexual encounter with a younger man. I didn't want any of those things uh, because I was uh, thinking about the way I feel at 63, uh, 63, as I was then. And I was enjoying the world as it was with the limitations that I had found myself with as I've aged. and. Um, and serious things happen and how do we cope with them? We don't cope with them by suddenly winning the lottery or suddenly, uh, you know, managing to uh, marry a rich man as you do in romance novels. I wanted this to be real. Addiction doesn't go away. The families of addicts remain the families of addicts forever. Um, and it's the way they cope that's the, the journey, the interesting journey, the way that they find to make sense of their lives and to remain loving. They are invented, um, so it's m m almost 100% a work of fiction. Uh, but I know that uh, the friends if you lay down early in life, you may not keep the friends, but you keep the ability to maintain friendships and because you've learned how. And I think that's, you know, we can be very grateful for those things because along the way, if we've learned to accept help and to ex and to give friendship, it will sustain us. It may not solve our problems, but it will sustain us. And I think Marnie has had some good role models in her life, has learned to be strong, is not looking for help, but help comes sometimes at really critical moments. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes she really is. She does hit the, the, the deepest, darkest rock bottom. I think it would have been really um, turgid without some humour. And I, it, honestly, from what I've under, understood, and I did a lot of research into this, but what I've, under, I've understood is there is madness, a kind of 
crazy madness that goes with addiction and with making bad choices. And I think Marnie's choice at the beginning is a little bit askew. You know, she's, she's skewed off the main line. She, she takes the children without telling anyone. She takes her daughter's phone and she just drives away and she doesn't think about it. She puts the phone down the bottom of the car and thinks, I don't want to know about it. I don't know what, I don't want to face what I've done. At some point she has to and she, and she has those moments of, oh my goodness, what have I done? All along the way. And the children are funny because children are, they, you know, they, these children are very needy children who have, probably haven't had a very good start in life, but they're still able to make her laugh. Um, and she's invited by people she meets along the way to do things that are funny things, funny, funny things that lighten the moment. There are moments where she can laugh because she's a person who can laugh and I think that helps. When I was 19, uh, I was walking along the Maribyrnong River very early one morning with my dog and a man drove up in a van which, when he pulled up, rather alarmed me and a young a man in his 30s jumped out and said, don't jump. And I thought, well, I wasn't going to, but I was probably looking a bit solemn. I was thinking about my life. I'd finished first year at university in New South Wales uh, in drama school. It had been a tough year and I was feeling very serious. And we talked. He stood there a long way away from me and chatted. And uh, I can't remember what we talked about. We talked about lots of things. And afterwards I laughed about it and I told my friends, oh, this person said this and this and it was funny. Because when you're 19, those things don't have much significance. But I, as I've got older, I've looked back on that moment, that strange, odd moment in my life, and I've thought that was such an act of kindness, that person doing that. He perhaps might have read my intent wrong, but he acted with the best possible intention. And I'm grateful for that kindness, and if I could meet him, I would say thanks. So I'm always writing something. Sometimes I put them under the bed and think, yeah, I'm not going anywhere, we'll leave it alone. But I always like to write. I'm a big reader. I read a lot of um, literature and, uh, and I admire it immensely. The thing about re admiring a lot of literature is that you can be very um, overwhelmed by how good it is. But I always write. I always write something somewhere. And um, yes, yes, I'm starting something now at the moment. Thank you for having me. That was really nice. <laughs> Thank you.